This is part two of our oral history with Mr. Bill Doyle. And Bill, uh, today is Saturday, April 4th, 2008. And we've just gotten finished talking about you arriving on the Salisbury Plains and in South Brent. Uh, in the Salisbury Plains, you stayed at the Tidworth Barracks. And you, uh, you were there for... Um, about six months where you trained every yes. day and your training is very similar to the kind of training you did in the States? Yes, yes, it was very, mm -hmm. very similar to what it was in the States, yes. You would go out and give me a typical day training. What would a day of training be like at Tidworth Barracks? <clears throat> we would march from, uh, from Tidworth out to the Salisbury Plains. That was uh, maybe, you, you may have been about 10 miles south of Salisbury, the city of Salisbury. Mm -hmm. And on the Salisbury Plains, that's where uh, the uh, Stonehenge, if you heard of that. Yes. It was there. Stonehenge was right there. We see, we would see Stonehenge every day because, uh, yeah. And then on Salisbury Plains also, there were great big mounds of dirt, and they were called, they called them burial mounds, where the people in ancient times buried their dead, you know. And, uh, but uh, the Salisbury Plains were nothing but pasture land for sheep. That, uh, that's what it was, it's mostly big herds of sheep out there. And was it just the 29th Infantry Division? Yes, the 29th. Oh, mm -hmm. it's still the 29th. It's, uh, the whole, the whole time that I was in the service, it was the 29th Division, nothing else. Nothing else. Yeah. And you were there. And, and when you were training, uh, and, and so you'd be out there and you would do maneuvers, did you fire weapons out there? Sometimes we did, mm -hmm. yes. I remember this one incident, too. As soon as we got to England, mm -hmm. they took the tripods away from our light machine guns. I don't know, they said they needed them in Africa. So we had no tripods for our light machine guns. And, uh, but the carpenter, we had a pretty good carpenter in our supply, worked with our supply sergeant. And he made little tripods out of wood that we could mount the machine gun on, you know. And when we did fire, we fired the guns out there, but blanks most of the time. We never fired any live ammunition out on the, uh, but I, I remember we did fire blank ammunition in those machine guns. I don't ever remember firing my rifle on maneuvers there, on the, on the rifle range, yes, but uh, that's the only time I ever fired my rifle in England. By the way, the rifle in England, was it still the 1903 Springfield rifle at that point? Oh, no. Mm -hmm. No, sometime while we were in the States, they took the Springfields away from us. And, uh, and we were issued the M1 rifle, the Garand M1 rifle then. It was, a much, it was a little heavier than the Springfield, but it was a good, it was a much better rifle. Much mm -hmm. better, yeah. Was it... It was more of a, a semi-automatic, an automatic? It was uh, semi-automatic. Yeah. Describe what that means, semi-automatic. <clears throat> well, each time you pull, pull the trigger, you would fire a shot. You could, you could fire that gun as fast as you could pull the trigger. Mm -hmm. That's it, yeah. But uh, it would not... You, <clears throat> it was no continuous fire like a machine gun, you know. Mm -hmm. You pull the trigger on a machine gun, you'd fire th a burst of three let it go and then a burst of three and a burst of three like that. You know? I see. Yeah. I see. That's a semi on a and and where there was was there a clip that went into a Yes, there was a clip. It's hard for me to remember now. There were about eight shells on a clip. Uh huh. Yeah. Eight shells on a clip. When the clip was down you'd have to pop another one another one in? It came out of the top of the gun. Yeah. Yeah. It uh, when you were finished the the uh, the last shell, the clip would fly out. You take another clip out of your cartridge belt and push it down in there, and uh, it far that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you were uh, when you moved down to uh, South Brent and then in the Moors, describe that kind of the of, Moors. What was that all about? Did you ever see mountains and water was running out of the top? <laughs> yeah. That's that was wet. That's all wet, 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 and uh, you had to be careful. 
to stay on solid ground most of the time because uh, you could step into a sinkhole there and go in and put it up to your shoulders mm -hmm. in water, you know. And uh, it's, uh, it's just moss growing across the top of water. And it's hard to detect. You don't know it's there. You don't know that there's, you just think you're walking across solid ground and all of a sudden you're down there to your knees and something in some kind of mud, you know. What, why did they train you in the moors? I think because that was the only place they had to train us, to tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. In the moors, that, uh, while we were there, that was the only place that uh, there was no solid ground around except in the moors. I mean, uh, no, the, there was just no solid ground there, that's all. When you were training on the moors, and then you... Uh... You, did you return at night to South Brent? Or oh, did yes. You, yes. Oh, yeah, you'd go out during the day, but you might leave 8 o'clock in the morning, and by 4 in the evening, 4.30, you were back for a retreat. And yes, we, we lived at South Brent. We lived in what they called Quonson Huts. Okay. You know what a Quonson Hut is? Describe that for us. Did you ever see a corrugated pipe? <laughs> yes. Okay, this is a big one, as big as this room, you know, and long. That's what it's like, about a half of a big piece of pipe. And uh, it might be 30, 30 or 35 feet long. Mm -hmm. At doors on each end, you know. And uh, they, they did have concrete floors in there. They were, at, uh, but that's what a Quonson hut was. It looked like a great big piece of pipe. And uh, semi half round, you know. Yeah. And that's the way we lived at South Brunt. And it wasn't wasn't bad. They were good. It was dry, and it was okay. It was it was it was as good as living in a barracks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How many, How long did you live in uh, uh, in the Quonset hut? Uh, at South Front. We South Front? we stayed there for maybe three or four months. So then, that that would have been uh, middle nineteen forty three or so, late forty three. In nineteen forty three. Mm hmm. Is when we moved down to uh, uh, St. Ives. St. Ives. Yeah. Tell, describe that. You moved to St. Ives. No. We were trucked there. Went there in trucks. And as soon as we got to St. Ives, we were billeted in an old hotel called the York House. And uh, our quarters there were pretty good. We had everybody... Uh, I, I know... Um, Two platoons lived in that hotel. One platoon lived down in St. Ives in another hotel down in St. Ives. And uh, at the York House, we had one squad had to move out of there and they moved into a private home right across the street from the hotel. That's where they had to, wherever they had room, that's where you would build it, you know. And this is the whole division that's, that's gone down to St. Ives? Well, no, well, not in St. Ives, no. no. The whole division was all around that neighborhood. All around. Maybe Penzance, Got it. Bodman, other places like that. They're all in that general all area. In, all in that general area down in Cornwall. It's what they called Land's End. In Cornwall, okay. Yeah. So you're out Land's End in Cornwall. Yeah. What's happening out there? <clears throat> there again, just maneuvers. Uh, infantry training again, that's all we did. And uh, it was different. It was a little different down there. That's where we first ran into hedgerows. Okay, tell us about that. But the the now, the hedgerows there in England were different than the ones in France. They the hedgerows uh, they weren't they were fences made out of rock, stones. That's all in England. And uh, that's where we first started maneuvering, using hedgerows was in England in Cornwall down there. <clears throat> you had some cover then, you know, you, you could move alongside of a fence, the stone fence. You're not out in the open. We never did go out in the open anymore after we had these fences to walk alongside of, you know, advance on. Uh, we, we did that for Oh, I guess we were there after three months when we were at uh, at at St. Ives. Orders came through for C Company to go home. 
we're going back to the States. Why did that happen? Do you know? Yes. We were to go to Liverpool in England and get some prisoners of war from Africa, German prisoners of war, and we took them uh, to a little town. We did that. We went to Liverpool and picked up these prisoners, and we marched them from Liverpool to a little town called Hoyton, H-U-Y-T-O-N, I think is the way they spelled it, where the prisoner of war camp was. Now, we were to keep them there and, uh, and get them refitted and clothing and things like that. And then we were, we were going to take them to Liverpool and get on a boat and go back to the States. Well, that never happened. Because we, I guess after about six weeks we were there, this colonel that had brought the troops, the prisoners from Africa to England, came to our area one day and he said, if anybody's going to take those troops home, it's going to be me. <laughs> and it was him. With C Company was sent back to St. Ives and we were back in the 175th Infantry again. And I'm glad, I really am glad that it happened that way because if we had gone home, I, I don't know what would have happened to us, you know. It, uh, we may have wound up in the Pacific, or probably the unit would have been broken up. We don't know what would have happened to us, you know, if we had gone back to the States. When you're training down, you've moved from South Brent, you've moved to the Moors, right, then to St. Ives, which is Cornwall. What's going on? Why are they moving you out to the Cornwall? Are you training in hedgerow country? You're training in... Yes. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Well, I'll, I'll tell you, at that time, when we moved down there, I think the whole time we were in England, we were attached to the 21st British Army Group, the 29th Division was, and we were under the command of General Montgomery. Yeah, for the whole time, even up to the time of the invasion, I think Montgomery had us until maybe three or four days after the invasion. and. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's the way it was. We were in the 21st British Army Group. And, uh, but although we never trained with the British soldiers, never trained with them at all, never. But uh, <clears throat> we were protecting the south or southern part of England mm -hmm. in case of an invasion. The Germans were thinking about invasing, invading England, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, uh the, the training that you had, um, did you guys ever get time off during your training? Did you ever oh, get sure. leave? Sure. Yeah. Well, we were at St. Ives. We, we were even getting three-day passes then. Yeah? Oh, yes. And we could, if you had time to go to London for a day, it took almost a day to get there if you wanted to go to London, you know. Did you do that? Oh, yeah, sure. Everybody wanted to go to Piccadilly Circus, you know. <laughs> Was it as interesting for you when you got there as you thought it would be? I remember, the, oh yes, the first, first time I went to London, I, I went to the Red Cross in uh, Knightsbridge. It was a real nice part of London and uh, it, was a good, it was a good place to go. Knightsbridge, the, the Red Cross uh, unit there, they were good to us. Now the second time I went to London, we tried to get to the that Red Cross place in Knightsbridge, and they wouldn't let us in. That was reserved for the Air Corps then. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> that was okay. But we had to go to uh, around Piccadilly. I guess you've heard of Piccadilly Circus, mm -hmm. yeah. And that's where the Red Cross, uh, there was a big Red Cross uh, hotel there that we stayed in. And, uh, were you in, good. Were you in communication with your wife during this time? Did she know where you were? No. Mm -mm. Oh no. Oh no. You could never tell your folks back home where you were. No. Okay. You couldn't. Uh, we had an APO twenty nine, and that was it. That's where our mail came to, and out of, and uh, that's all. Were you still able to write and let them know how you were doing and oh, what yeah, you're doing you fine? Oh, yeah, you could write as often as you want. I see. Every day you could Good. write you know, as often as you wanted to. I still have, my wife cut the le kept the letters that I wrote and I still have hers too, you know. That's yeah. nice. And, uh, <laughs> but yeah, we, we, 
you weren't restricted. The only thing you could not tell where you were or what you were doing. Got it. No, you couldn't tell. That, that makes sense. All. Tell me after your your training then in Cornwall at St. Ives and, and, and what happens next after that training in the, in the Cornwall area? After Cornwall, uh, sometime in May, around the middle of May in 1944, we went to a marshalling area in a part of Cornwall. It was near Falmouth and it was called Nine Maidens. Nine Maidens. Mm -hmm. That's where that marshalling area was. And uh, <clears throat> that's where we were told what we were going to do, what we were going to do, where we were going, and everything else, you know. But you could not get out of that place. They had, they told me there were Secret Service people all around the, that camp. So this would have been when they told you that you were going to go to Normandy? Oh, well, yeah. Let yeah. me ask you, but before Normandy, what about Slapton Sands? What what happened there? Did, did, were oh, you, didn't you have to train? Did you do that was beach it. landings and the, stuff? They, my, my regiment went through that training in January of 1944. Take me back to that. What happened in January of 1944? We were up near, near Dartmouth at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were training up there. And I remember... I remember they taking us into the, uh, I guess it's the English Naval Academy there. And they showed us, they had a big map, a sand map on tables, almost longer than this room here, you know. Of the, and it was supposed to be the coast of France. Hell, what the uh, Omaha Beach and Utah Beach and all of them looked like, you know. And, uh, they did. They th they showed us that map, and uh, but then uh, that's when we got on those the the LSTs to go to Slapton Sands there at Dartmouth, and uh, we were out in the water for maybe maybe a day on those ships, and they we got came down those off those ships on rope ladders into LCVPs. And the LCVP took us into the beach, like as if we were going on to Omaha Beach, you know. That's what it's supposed to be like. Was that your first experience in an LCVP? Yes. Yep. Yes, it was. My, my first experience, yes. And an LCVP is short for landing? It's a landing craft vehicle or personnel. LC, landing craft vehicle personnel. And would I call that a Higgins boat? He dare not call it a Higgins boat. Okay, why not? It wasn't a Higgins boat. It was an LCVP. Okay. It was made by the Higgins Company. Down made by the Higgins. But she didn't call him a Higgins boat. It was an LCVP. Yeah. And, an uh, LCVP. How many men were in a, were in an LCVP? My, my whole platoon was in one of them. Your whole uh, platoon? Yeah, you could mm -hmm. get a whole. You could get three squads in one. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so you climb down the side of the LST. It was a uh, a cargo net. Mm -hmm. Is what it was hanging over the side of the of the, the the landing craft tank. LCT is what it was. Yeah. So we kind of climbed down the cargo nets into the LCBP, oh, yeah. and they would take us into the beach, just like we did the same way we went to Normandy, exactly the same way. How many times did you did you practice that going at, at the slap well, and sands? My or... my regiment only did it once. Really. One time. I think we, we we maneuvered out in the water like that several times, but on on British boats, we would pull up to the beach. Everybody would get off the boat, and the boat would be stranded. The tide's going down so fast, the boat stuck there. Really? And, and we too, until the tide came back in again, and then the, we could get back on the boat and go on about, about our business, you know. But yeah, well, while the tide was out. We would do maneuvering. We we would be maneuvering around on the beach or someplace doing something. We just didn't lay around all day, yeah. waiting for the tide to come. I'll in, bet you know? didn't. Yeah. Uh, but that's the truth. The tide went out so fast that, that if the I remember those LSTs, LCVPs, mm -hmm. they would hit the beach, and almost as soon as they'd hit the beach, they'd throw a big anchor out the back of the boat, 
and they start pulling the boat off again, off the beach, because they would be stuck there if they didn't. That's, and they, the tide would go out real fast. And, uh, but I don't know how many times we were stranded on the beach like that, waiting for the tide to come back in again. So you do this, you would come in on the LCVP, get off, yeah. get off it, and then you, you, you'd be stranded because the, the tide would, would have gone away and the, the ship couldn't, the, the, the boat couldn't go back out. That's right, yeah. yeah. That's right. And yeah. they couldn't get out of there until the tide came back in again. We made, uh, only one time we maneuvered on a, on a British LCA. I think it was the landing craft attack or assault, whichever you want to call it. And that was a nice little boat. It was smaller, much smaller than the LCVP, and it would only hold two squads of men. But it was the gunnel, I bet the gunnel wasn't a foot off the water. You were way down in the boat. And they told me what the, uh, one of the fellows, the British soldiers on the boat, or sailors, told me it was powered by two Rolls Royce engines in the back, yeah. And it was quiet, just as quiet as it could be. The commandos used them for their, when they made the raids on, in Norway and places like that, you know. Yeah. Are they, because the gunnels are lowered, does that give you more protection inside the, is it better to... Protection and uh, you couldn't see them as well. Mm -hmm. And the LCVP was a big thing, you know, a big boat. And, uh, but the, the LCA that the British had was, uh, it was a real nice little boat. I, I liked it, to tell you the truth. But I'd only been, I only, only went out on that LCA one time. The, uh, when you finished your training doing the, the Slapped in Sands mm -hmm. training area, was it that, at that point did you go to Nine Maidens? Is that when you went no. to the marshalling area? Oh, no. no. That was in, this was in January. Okay. When we did that Slapped in Sand business. Okay. And, uh, but, uh, they were doing that up until April. Okay. Different outfits going had to go through it. I think the 116th Infantry went through it twice. Yeah, they went back for a refresher course on it because they were going to, going to hit the beach first anyway in Normandy. And, uh, and the, at this point, though, you still don't know it's going to be Normandy, right? You're, 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 you just no. know you're practicing landings. No. Yeah. We, we didn't know anything about where we were going to land in Normandy. When I told you about the sand maps, you know, Yeah. We, it was just a coast. <laughs> it, it didn't say Normandy, it didn't say Utah Beach or anything on there. It just, just said the, the coast of France, you know. Coast of France. Yeah. Now, when you um, wind up uh, over the next couple of months before May, what happens after you did your Slapped and sla Sands training? Did you... Do well, other after that, we went back to St. Ives again. Okay. Yeah, back to St. Ives, and and we did our regular training there until until May, like the middle of May in mm -hmm. 1944, and that's that's when we went to Nine Maidens. That was your marshalling area. Yeah, marshalling area. What happened at Nine Maidens? What happened then? Well, it was like you were in a big prison camp. Mm -hmm. Only you weren't a free, you were not prisoners, you know, but you couldn't get out. No one could get in there or out of the place. And uh, like I said, it was guarded by Secret Service men. And uh, that's where we were told exactly what we were going to do, where we were going and everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. we stayed in that marshalling area. All we had to do there, all we could do there was nothing. Mm -hmm. Eat and sleep, that's what it was for. And, uh, let's see, it was in, uh, I think it was on June the 3rd, we left that area. And we went to, it was either the 3rd or the 4th, because I remember, I know we got on the LC, on the LCT. Mm -hmm on the 5th of June. And that's, uh, <clears throat> we were on our way then to Normandy. But uh, for some reason or another, 
it seems to me like they they called it off one time. Yeah, the, uh, according to the history, there was they were supposed to have gone June fourth into June fifth. Yeah, and then it was called off, and then June fifth into June sixth. That's right? right. We went. They went back. Went back to uh, Plymouth again, not Plymouth, but Falmouth. Were you on the ship? Did you actually go out and come back? Oh yeah. Okay, well, so you were on. We didn't come right back into the harbor again. We came back towards France. I mean England, you know. Now we stayed on that boat the whole time. I never got once I got on that boat. I never got off again. You were on the boat the whole time until the seventh of June when I did get off. And an LCT is a what kind of ship is that? Landing craft tank. How big is it? Uh, oh. It's a big, it's a great, it's a big, big ship, but uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't know how big it is to tell you. It's, I know it was a big ship. The doors on the front of it would open up, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, that's uh, the tanks are all down in the bottom, if they were calling tanks. But uh, when I went over, there were just, there were no tanks, there were just trucks and things like that on it. Was it on that LCT? Was it just your infantry regiment, the 175th? Right, right. the 175th infantry was on there. So you went out and you came back and then you went out again. Then yeah. you were ordered mm -hmm. to go. Where are you? Are you down in the hold of the LCT? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Were you able to see out well, at all? I remember when I got on that boat, they gave me a bunk. It was one that you pulled down from the side of the side of the boat, you know, and. Uh, it's yours for three hours, and you got to give it up to somebody else. Really? Yeah. It's uh, there was there wasn't a whole lot of room on the boat for all those men, you know. You had to stand. Yeah. Uh, well, you could walk around. But, uh, I. It was we weren't uncomfortable. Let's put it that way. Not mm -hmm. But we didn't. Johnny Burns and I, a friend of mine, we went up on the top deck, put our uh, shelter half down, slept on it right outside of the wheelhouse on that boat. I remember I always got in trouble there. But, uh, they had a, a big rack in there with guns on it, you know, rifles. And uh, I asked this officer, I said, what, what do you got all those guns for? You guys don't use them. And that was a wrong thing to say. <laughs> he started the spit and sputter and luckily, He's uh, he got a call on the radio and he had to leave me. <laughs> but yeah, I, I shouldn't have said that to him, you know. But uh, they they did have a big rack with rifles and the automatic weapons on there. I said, "What do you fellas need those for? You don't fight." <laughs> that was a bad thing to say. But anyway, it, uh, you're uh, you're you're going across in this uh, this convoy across the. Yeah, the English Channel. Did you did you get a chance to look at the other ships that were going across? Oh yeah. yeah. When I I woke up that morning on the the seventh of uh, of June, there were two big lines of ships, uh, lines of ships, one going this, it, both going the same way, you know, mm -hmm. like this, mm -hmm. and there was little minesweepers running up in between there, just as fast as they could go. I guess they were minesweepers. I don't know what else they would have been. But yeah, there was a whole, gosh, when I looked out, I, I know I could have seen 20 or 25 ships, you know, on each side of us. Yeah. And then the, when, that, uh, when that officer, when he got a call on the radio, that's when all of us started getting, getting together, <clears throat> getting our equipment together to get off the boat. Yeah. We were almost all on the coast of France then. Yeah. When you came in, describe uh, the time of day. So you get there on June 6th. You, what happens on the 6th of June on D-Day? No, I did not get there on the 6th of June. My, Tell, reg, my what regiment, happened? I was still out on the water. Mm -hmm. I, the ship that I was on was on the water from the, the 6th of June, from the 5th, from the 5th of June, and I did not get off that boat until the 7th, about 10 or 12 o'clock in the morning on the 7th of June. Why? because we could not get on the beach. Mm -hmm. We were supposed to land, the 29th Division was supposed to land in a column of regiments, 116th, 115th, and then 175th. The beach was too crowded, we could not get on. As a matter of fact, they were thinking about pulling the troops off the beach at one time. 
So we we just stayed out in the water until the next day, and then we uh, we got climbed down the cargo nets and to LCVPs and landed. You came in on the seventh of June no, and landed. Of June. And can you can you describe what the beach looks like on the seventh yes. of June, Bill? What what did yeah. you see? There were wrecked landing craft all over the beach. Mm -hmm. Dead soldiers. As a matter of fact, when that when my LSC, LS, LCVP hit the beach and the ramp went down, it almost landed on a dead soldier there. And uh, I've told this story so many times that uh, he, uh, he, there was something odd about him that I couldn't figure out. I looked at him and he didn't have a head. He said he's had a little piece of bone back there, and that's about all. We, when we landed, we kept on going inland. We had no, we didn't run into any fire. Maybe uh, some sniper fire every once in a while, but no, we had no, had no trouble at all getting off the beach. Do you remember when you came off the beach? What exit you used coming up off we, the beach? I, my boat landed on Dog Green. Dog Green. Dog Green Beach. Uh, that was right near, right near the Veraville draw. Mm-hmm. Dog Green Beach, uh, and and at that point you were able to go right up, went, work went, your way up. Yeah, we did not go right up the Barrowville Draw. We went inland. The uh -huh. Barrowville Draw. There was a road coming down there to the beach. We didn't go up that far. You went a different. We way. went uh, cross country. That's all. Yeah. Yeah, cross, cross country. country. And um, and so you walked it. You guys. What was your immediate goal that first day? What what did you have to do? Uh, the first day, we were supposed to go right to Isini. We were supposed to start start our march to Isini. Isini, France? Yeah, okay. But my platoon couldn't find the rest of the company, the rest of the C Company. So that whole day of uh, June the 7th, we were maneuvering around on our own looking for C Company, but that night we stayed with the 115th Infantry. Okay. And the next day, on the 8th of June, is when we, all of C Company, got together again. And we started our march to Isini. Okay. That was our objective. And we we went through that little town of Lacombe. Mm -hmm. Lacombe. On the 8th of June. And that night, I remember, we were out on, on some real high ground outside of the city of Isini. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were bivouacked up there. We had to dig in, we just dug in and slit trenches, we had no tents. And I remember a plane coming over, going out towards the, the coast. And he, when he got over our position, I think every gun on one of those, on those ships out there opened up. And it, the sky was just full of tracers, you know. And it seemed to me like that plane saw those tracers and he came around, turned around, came back and dropped that darn bomb right on our position. And uh, at the, I, because I, I remember dirt flying all over us. It was, I don't know how, I don't know how many men we lost or if we lost any, but I know <laughs> that dirt from that bomb, that, that explosion was coming down on Johnny Burns and I. Johnny Burns was a good friend of mine. We always bunked together and we dug our trenches together and everything like that. But uh, but that was one incident that I'll never forget. Mm -hmm. That plane coming back and dropping that bomb on our position. This would have been about the 8th of June. That was the evening of the 8th of June, mm -hmm. yes. And yeah. Mm -hmm. Continue. You know, the the next day, on the 9th of June, is when we started our attack on the city of Isini. And I remember going into that town, and it was like something you would see in the movies. That the whole town was on fire. I think every building in that town was burning. And Isini is a it's a fair sized little village. Mm -hmm. And uh, but. <clears throat> Were you engaging the Germans by this time, or had it just? Yes. Were, you, were you guys actively firing your weapons and, and right, coming in? Right. Now, when you in, in a platoon, what are your orders? What, are the, what does your platoon leader tell you to do? What What are they telling you at this point? How do you How Say, do you do hey, battle? 
we've got to clear, we've got to clear the town out, that's all. So you just start from here going to another place, you're fighting, mm -hmm. fighting with German soldiers. What else is there to say? That, uh, was know? at this point, was this, was this house to house fighting? No, mm -mm. no, I never did any house to house fighting. No house to house. I never house. did the whole okay. time I was in the service. I never did any house to house. It was all out in the open in fields. Okay. But going through that town, I, I never went into a house, always fighting on the outside and the streets, you know. But I, I never went into any house. To, you might call it house to house fighting, but I was never inside. There's it. no actual house to house no, fighting. No. But it's on street corner to street, right. block to block fighting. That's right. Yeah. And what kinds of weapons are they firing at, at, at you, at your troops? Mostly their rifles, just like we had, you know. Sometimes you get mortar shells. Mm -hmm. They had, they were always throwing mortar shells at you. Mm -hmm. But uh, mostly it was just small arm fire. Bill, when you, when you first come into a combat situation. You you guys have trained all these months and all these years. What's it like to go do that? What is it? Do you say to yourself, "My God, I'm in combat now. I yeah. have to protect myself." What well, do you think about? There, there was no way that you could protect yourself. <laughs> you know, you just did whatever you were told to do. You go from this place to that place, and. Uh, from one from one field to another, you know, just fighting through it. and uh, from one hedgerow to another. That's all. And if you were lucky, you made it from one place to the next. You know. Yeah. As you come into his signy, were you were you actually coming in? You did you have to go through fields first, and then you no. come to the city? No. When we went into Isini, mm -hmm. the town, it was always on the roads. On the roads. I okay. Going right down the road. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To. Uh, and it was always that kind of fighting in that town, mm -hmm. in that city, always on the streets, you know. And, uh, and then you, on the 9th of June... That battle didn't last very long. No. No. I'd say four or five hours and it was all over. And uh, the Germans were gone. <clears throat> that city of Vicini is on a little inlet, uh, the Our River, I think it is goes in there and uh, it was this, there was a German flotilla of e-boats in there and that's what they wanted to get out get rid of these uh, there were uh, the e-boats were little uh, like PT boats mm -hmm. but my, they were bigger than our PT boats and they had more armor on them I believe but that's what was in there and they used them to raid ships out in the channel you know then I don't know if they, uh, I don't think they went out in the ocean. They may have, but in the English Channel. And How about after you liberated Isigny? What happened next? Okay. Isigny was on the 9th, the 9th of June. And I remember on the 11th of June, we went to the Vera River well, on the coast, right on the Vera River, and the uh, Little rowboats were waiting for us. We had to fill these boats up with men, and we rowed our way, rowed across the river to the other side, and that was the. That was on the 11th of June. It was C Company and G Company went across. It was a re reconnoit. It was, it was a reconnaissance mission. And. Uh, G Company went across first because their boats came in first. They were just rowboats, that's all they were. They got into a firefight and they came back across the river. They retreated back all the way across the river again and Z Company's over there by ourselves then this time. And uh, <clears throat> we really were getting a hard time. But uh, G, when G Company came back, our colonel, uh, or maybe it was the general said he sent another company over and but G company had to go back too and uh, it was Colonel Good was our our uh, regimental commander mm -hmm. he said they, they're not going to do much unless I go with them the generals will go with them then and uh, 
while he was over there, he was captured. You know, there were three companies of us that went across that river on that reconnaissance mission. 110 of us came back from that. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was uh, it was the worst debunkle I ever saw in my life. And, no, and nobody ever knew what we were what we were going or what we were supposed to do or anything. Really? Else. We had no artillery support, no <laughs> radios, no nothing. We you were on your own. There. Yeah, that's all right. And that's the truth. There was nothing there for us. When you learned it was a, a reconnaissance mission, did you know what, what exactly you were to do? Well, they, yeah. The general, the, the higher ups in our division thought that Germans were massing their tanks over there and they wanted to find out for sure if they were or in how many, you know, just what was going on. Let's see if I can remember. I, I can't remember the name of that town anymore. Well, anyway, that's that's what we were supposed to look for. Reconnoiter, see, seeing what the Germans were doing, if yep. there were any tanks or anything there. We never did find out anything. And there was uh, a lot of fighting. A lot, Not of, a lot uh, of fighting. <clears throat> Most of the, now, the Colonel Good, everybody thought at first that he had been killed because they found, somebody found these helmets, you know, and but he was really captured, taken prisoner. And... Uh, I guess most of the people that were missing were taken prisoner, and they could have been killed too or wounded, you know. But that's the truth. Those, those, those three companies that went over there, 110 of us came back. That. Do you do you would describe before you've talked about General Coda? Was he involved in 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 that? If it hadn't been for General Coda. I don't think any of us would have come back from that mission. What happened there? Tell me he, how he got uh, involved. He and he and Colonel Good were the two. Uh, General Coda was a brigadier general at the time. Colonel Good was a bird colonel. But uh, you've said in the past that you have, you fought shoulder to shoulder with General Coda back in that in that. I did. I was with that man. For almost three days, how and uh, he was a soldier. That, that's all I can say. That man was a good soldier. Uh-huh. And, uh huh. He was, and I believe that if it hadn't been for him, I don't think any of us would have gotten back across that river again. Yeah. That uh, the what? Germans are the Germans were picking people off just one just like that, you know. When I remember, maybe I told you this before that. Uh, running past this opening in a hedgerow. We were almost back to the river. I ran across there, okay. This little medic was behind me and he was killed there. He got right out in the middle of the hedgerow, uh, in that opening in the hedgerow, and somebody shot him, killed him, you know. And uh, it, it really makes you think sometimes, why, why him, not me, you know. But uh, then, from then on, uh, I guess 20 minutes after that, I was back on the river, on the Vere River. Was this all kind of a retreating mode? You guys were all retreating back to the Vere? Yeah. And General Coda helped ensure in this That's battle right. that he yeah. got you back. And General Coda, for the record, can you tell us again who he was? Did I what? Could you just tell us again who General Coda was with the 29th Division? General well, he was the assistant division commander. Mm -hmm. That's what General Coda was. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I would say he was the best soldier in the whole division. <laughs> right. uh, I think he was anyway. Mm -hmm. he was, uh, yeah, obviously, uh, he thought to be right up front there to leading the men to, to help him get you guys out of that situation yes, was pretty yes, tight. Yes, he was. Mm -hmm. And it seemed like he always knew what to do. That, uh, he, he always had an answer for everything, you know, that, that just where to go and what to do. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I'm, it, I'm a pretty good friend of his grandson, Tom Morris, who lives out in Denver, Colorado. We get together on the telephone every once in a while, and I spent a good bit of time with him last year in Normandy. Mm -hmm. Tom, Tom Morris is his name. Yeah. Now, the uh, General Coda worked with that, and you guys got out of this Veer, Veer, this Veer River crossing mm -hmm. that turned into a debacle over three right. days. It was a big debacle. And you got back, yeah. back across the Veer. And then what happened then? This is about it, June 11th or so? Let's see, that was, uh, we started that attack over there on the 11th, and I think 
it's either the 13th or 14th, we were about back probably on the 14th of June, we were back across the river. And that, uh, that's again where we were grouped and resupplied and uh, we got some replacements in. Mm -hmm. And on the, uh, on the 17th of June is when we had started our attack on Hill 108. Now, before we talk about Hill 108, let me ask you a couple of questions. Had, is it, you're coming into hedgerow country as soon as you get out of Assigny. Do you yeah. start to see the hedgerows? Do you right there? I mean, the hedgerows are all around. Oh, outside. yeah, there's nothing but hedgerows. Nothing there. but hedgerows. Many, sure, nothing but hedgerows. Uh, now, but they, they were different than in England, you know. England, they were just fences made out of stone, mm -hmm. rocks, you know. Here, they were mound, the hedgerow was a mound of dirt. Mm -hmm with uh, vegetation growing out of the top of it, you know. That's, that's what the fence was. Did you have to learn how to fight in the hedgerows? Did, did you yeah, did well, tactics? As a matter of fact, we did not know that people were going into hedgerow country like that. We did have to learn right fast. And, uh, but... Can you describe it, the tactics that you, you would did take? Have, uh, you did have a good bit of cover when uh, if you were going from one hedgerow, from one field to another, you never went out in the middle of the field. Always alongside, alongside of the hedgerow, you know, it'd go up like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, that way you had more cover. Because the Germans, at the hedgerow in front of you, they were lined up across it. You couldn't see them because they were hiding behind vegetation on the top of these hedgerows. And, uh, the only thing you could do was to get up to that hedgerow as fast as you could and start throwing maybe hand grenades over it, you know. Because you, you could not see, you couldn't see the German soldiers. That's all there was to it. They were sort of well in place behind you. Yeah, these. sure. Mm -hmm. So if you had a field, if you had to take a, 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 a parcel of land, you're moving t towards something, yeah. it's a hedgerow, which is a square yeah, that's field. Right. Uh, field that's plowed, where, where it's being farmed, surrounded by these hedgerows. Right. Right. Now you would have a supporting um, um, uh, mortar and artillery fire to to help with the troops going up, or would you not? Sometimes they might. Before you start an attack, they might throw some artillery at you know up there, and uh, a lot of times they did, or maybe they might throw some uh, mortar shells up to the next hedgerow, but didn't do a whole lot of good because the Germans were really trench. They, they were dug in. Unless you see one of these hedgerows, you can't imagine what it's like, what the fighting would be like in there, you know. Fighting from one field to another where you can't see anybody and they can see you, you're out in the open, they can see you when you can't see them. And, uh, They're, uh and yeah, they can see and you can't see them. You have to come across that field, right? Sure. And because you need to take where they are, to that's, take that to take right. that over to to get that land. Mm -hmm. Tell me about why was what was Hill One Hundred Eight? Where where is it located, and what what was it all about? Hill One Hundred Eight was about uh, maybe maybe about three miles, and it was real high ground before you get to Saint Lo. Mm -hmm. Yes, and it was high ground. And uh, that's what you always wanted to get the high ground anyway, you know, because then, then you can look down on the enemy. Mm -hmm. But uh, Hill 108 was, it was some high ground right outside of a little town called, uh, oh my goodness, my, my, my memory now. That's okay. Uh, I can't remember the name of the town because, but I, I should because we're going to put a memorial up there next year. Oh, we'll go over that. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. But, uh, I, I guess uh, my memory isn't working very, very well right now. But, uh, I, I should know the name of that town. <laughs> we'll come back to that about yeah. the, but the name of the town with Hill One Hundred Eight. And you were talking about when you went in onto the hill. Uh, tell me about what your mission was. You had to take the hill. Right. We had to take the hill away from the Germans. We did. Uh, I think it was on the on the 18th. Mm -hmm. We took that hill away from the Germans, and then they counterattacked and took it back. But we never did leave the hill. They did counterattack. But on the 19th of June, 
the hill belonged to us. It belonged to the, uh, the 29th Division. And the, uh, <laughs> was it just C? Still, I'm still trying to think of the name of the town. Was it just C Company that did it? Oh, no, it was the 1st Battalion. 1st Battalion. 1st Battalion, 175th Infantry. B Company, B Company was the point. Mm -hmm. And uh, they took pretty bad, they took, took pretty much of a beating up there, C, B Company did. And mm -hmm. uh, C Company did too, mm -hmm. as they were right along. They were in front of us. But uh, we lost a lot of men up there on that hill. I don't think I had a dozen men in my platoon left in my platoon when that battle was over. And your your uh, your goal is to come across that, uh, try to take that hill. Yeah. Right. And there, are, I guess, there are contiguous hedgerows that the Germans are behind that, that are uh, working oh, yeah. to stop you. The name of the town is Villers Frossard. Villers Frossard. Villers Good job. Frossard. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Villers Frossard. Okay. Yeah. And that was down at the bottom of that hill. Mm -hmm. As we were up top, looking down on the town like that. You know. The 115th infantry was over to our left. I don't know where the 116th was, uh, but they they were not near Hill 108. Uh, it's close quarters with the Germans. You're coming right up to take. You have yeah. to take this right. And and when you're as a platoon sergeant, you're you're leading your men. You're you're told right. to take your men. I had to. At that time, I had no platoon leader. We, uh, platoon leaders didn't last very long. These would have been the the uh, officers, yeah. the lieutenants. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they they were they were all. But platoon leader was usually a first a second lieutenant, and uh, but uh, I didn't have them very. I didn't. I, I'll tell you the truth. The one that I had on the my platoon leader on the seventeenth of July when I was wounded, I didn't even know him. Mm. I was only with him for about a day, and uh, I didn't know the man at all. He was wounded about an hour before I was wounded. Yeah. When you are uh, back on the 17th and 18th of June, when you're on Hill 108, you're taking these guys, trying to trying to take this this hill. Hell yeah. And you would, if you could just describe for me an action. Uh, how do you get across the hedgerow? How do you do that? How do you, as the platoon sergeant, do that? 